Yeah, I am Azariah Journey. My pronouns are she, her, or they, them. And I am a junior at UNCG with the history department and a minor in women's gender and sexuality studies. Okay. Well, thank you for agreeing to do this interview for us here on August the 19th, 2020. Um, can you start by telling me where you are from? Yeah, I am originally from Louisville, Kentucky. So the south end of Louisville, um, what we called it. And I was born and raised there, but I graduated high school in Chicago, Illinois, and have been uh, in Greensboro for about three years. Okay, did you come to Greensboro so that you could attend UNCG? I did not. I came to Greensboro because my wife was here. <laughs> and uh, she was here and I was in Kentucky and Greensboro seemed like a way better place than Louisville did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So made the trip. Good, good. And you decided to major in history and minor in women's and gender and sexuality studies. Tell us why you decided to do that. Yeah, so I had a history professor while I was getting my associate's degree in Kentucky that really spoke life into me and taught me how to view history differently. When you're raised in the South, the history that you're taught is very whitewashed. I learned very quickly with this professor. And it was this eye-opening experience that I didn't know facts of what really had happened when I thought that I had. Um, so she and I had dialogue together. And uh, when I decided to move, uh, I was talking to her about a major to pick for my uh, bachelor. And she said, you know, you love history. Why are you, why do you keep fighting this, um, this battle, you know, trying to find a major that you think will work when this is what you should do. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> I talked to my wife about it and um, got in with the history department at UNCG, but the uh, WGS program um, was because I met with a couple of the students in the history department that were also in the WGS department. And being newly out, newly married, um, it was something that I realized very quickly. I didn't know a lot about my queer ancestors or the community as a whole, and I wanted to make sure that I did. So I just plugged in and has been a something I've enjoyed ever since, so. So your focus in history, what appeals to you is queer history? Uh, American history, mm -hmm. um, but when I say American history, I'm, I really like to dig into the history that's not taught. So mm -hmm. I like to research why it's not being taught, what um, were the steps of it being erased, what was the intentions of it being done, and why is the I guess public opinion of it okay for this to happen. In 2020, we've kind of gotten this um, age of enlightenment, I'd like to call, you know, mm -hmm. the corona enlightenment in a degree where um, people are having dialect that didn't happen before. And it's allowing people to educate themselves, which hasn't happened in probably 60 years. Mm -hmm. So um, it was something that I just was very passionate about and um, became more and more passionate about the more that I discovered um, groups being erased and not being taught and kind of decided that that's where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about your experiences growing up. Yeah, so I am a Southern Baptist pastor's kid. Okay. Um, I was raised in church. Um, I was raised, we always joke I was raised on the altar, so I used to open up for bands um, revivals, uh, was on the tour circuit, tour circuit for a while. Um, my mom was, um, Southern Baptist, you know, private school raised as well. And, um, when I was, I think 13, my parents got divorced, but, um, they both kind of went separate ways. So in that they both went away from their original self. So they got into some pretty heavy drugs and just some things that, um, really messed them up. And in doing so, I grew up very quick. So I raised my younger brother um, and then life happened and I just decided to step up when I needed to and make sure that my younger brother had a childhood um, when I didn't. Um, but that was the best, one of the best decisions I've ever made. And it caused me to learn how to speak and to ask questions and to kind of um, be an ally for myself 
and then learn what it means to be an ally for others when you can't be for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thankful. Um, growing up in church, it kind of teaches you something about faith. And uh, when I came out, um, that faith was kind of taken away because of the church culture that we live in. But um, I was lucky to find College Park here in Greensboro that's affirming and open and loving and um, kind of respoke that faith back into my life. So were you aware of racial disparities and racism while you were growing up? I, I wasn't, um, but there are instances I can look back on now as an adult and go, oh, that's, that was really wrong. Like I was taught this, this was not something I learned. Mm -hmm. um, one example is when I was um, really young, I had a, um, one of my first friends was black and I can remember my grandmother and mother laughing and saying, you know, she just doesn't know how to have white friends. She just, it's just not in her blood. Um, and I couldn't, I just don't remember why that was said when I was a kid, but the older I got, I, I was like, this didn't really make sense. But growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, and you know, this Bible belt or gateway into the Bible belt, there were Confederate flags everywhere. There was this lost cause narrative that is taught and ingrained in people's ideology and makeup, and they don't understand the history of it. They just understand what they've been spoon fed to believe. Mm -hmm. So when I started going against the grain, um, it was a huge issue for my family members because this wasn't something that they were taught. They were taught to hate. And they thought that this passing of a torch, if you'll, if you'll say that, um, of hate between generations, it stopped with me and my brother. Um, and that was just something that was a huge issue with the family. Like there were always comments said on, you know, why can't, um, why can't they have white friends? Why do they only have black friends? Why, why do they go to a black church? Why, you know, why are they separating themselves from us or comments? Um, if we would go to uh, rallies or public events, it was, you need to surround yourself with these types of people, not these types of people. Um, so it wasn't until I really started questioning it and going against what I was taught that I noticed it. Um, and then when I did notice it, it was a huge wake up call, but not at first, which is upsetting, but it's, it's such a normal um, occurrence for white people in the South. It's something that's taught until you're untaught it or you unlearn it. And so you're saying that for you, you began to make conscious decisions to unlearn what you I did thought. yeah um because my best friend um her name is Shamaya we met on the first day of ninth grade in high school and walked onto the bus and all the seats were full but there was one next to her and I asked if I could sit and she jokes that I sat next to her for the last 10 years so uh, her family really took me in and when I realized that a black family was just as normal if not better than the family I grew up in and fostered conversations for me to learn and allowed me to ask questions that I couldn't in Louisville mm -hmm. I realized how easily ingrained hate was mm -hmm. and just started you know, asking questions, asking my parents why they felt this way, questioning why they had these beliefs and still had a faith that they believed in and how that didn't work in my mind. Um, but it was a, it was a long, uh, it was a long process of me asking questions and being with individuals who allowed me to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And um, they became, and they're family to me now. They, you know, Shemaya's mom will call me her daughter. I get phone calls for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, one of the jokes that we have is the first Thanksgiving I was at their house. Um, they always joke that was the first time I tasted real food. So that's been this joke that we've had since then. Um, and now that my wife and I are married and we're hosting Thanksgiving, they mess with her about, you know, I don't know if she can, <laughs> if she can cook anything just yet. She hasn't been with the family for a couple of years. So it's this, uh, where one family kind of let me go. My best friend's family took me in and that, I mean, that for me was more than anything I could have ever asked and just lit this fire in me to keep educating people on their ignorance and how it's taught and learned and not something that you're born with. So, 
Yeah. So when, tell us more about that. When did you start to move outside of your own personal experience to an external experience where you were, um, you mentioned earlier, going to rallies or protests or maybe doing some other things? Yeah, um, that really started in church. Um, being a pastor's kid, you're kind of taught how to be this extrovert and to go out into the community and do these things. Mm -hmm. But when I realized that where I was at in my faith was not where I was at in my mindset because I had learned. It took me going to these different rallies in Louisville, um, pride rallies. This was before I came out, um, talking to my black friends about what it means to attend these rallies and what it meant to be a, um, a white person at these rallies as an ally and what it meant to continue this education for white people where we've had for the past forever, um, black individuals teaching this and having this work done, but white people not listening because it's not done by a white creator. And there was a conversation that we had had about how all this work had been done, but there, white, the white community is still not listening unless a white spokesperson comes out and says, hey, here's this fantastic, um, you know, minority group, let's get behind them. And then it's this savior complex that the white community has had. And that really bothered me mm -hmm. um, because that, you know, the more I kind of looked into the historical side of things, I couldn't find where that hadn't been the case. There was always this savior mentality or this uh, knight in shining armor of white, the white community coming behind and helping get the cause out when that wasn't the case. There had been all these other communities doing this work that needed to be done and they were not being heard and me going there listening to listening to understand and not listening to respond taught me how to make bold moves and actions in a way that isn't a savior complex mm -hmm. where I can come in and say to my black leaders or um, community elders and say, what do you need from me? What can I do to help? Instead of coming in where we see a lot going, how can I take over this to make it more friendly for white folks? And then we'll leave once it's no longer a trend. Mm -hmm. um, so once I kind of, sh you know, learned that and had those conversations, it was, okay, what can I do now to make sure that the platform that I'm building for others allows me to share with a community that doesn't know this? And it just kind of grew from there, personal conversations at coffee shops, um, finding out when little groups were meeting. And it wasn't until I moved to Greensboro that I really got connected. Um, because coming out in Kentucky was scary, especially as a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. um, I had death threats. My car was key. Tires were popped. Um, a ton of other things. And in the span of 24 hours of me coming out, I moved here out of safety concerns. Mm -hmm. um, I had planned on moving to Greensboro. I was ready to make the move, but um, not within a 24-hour period. And when I did that and kind of started becoming who I am more and more, I realized that Greensboro had such great leaders and I wanted to connect with them just like I did in Louisville. And what they saw in me was, okay, we have, you've done the work up until this point, help us lead. And that was this, it was kind of this, again, this pa passing of a torch. Um, you've put in work, we've seen your work, we know what's going on and you're good to go. Um, and then, you know, Greensboro's become home and now there's this huge community of young activists and this amazing stage where work is being done. And it took me moving here to realize Greensboro had already been home to this national stage before. I hadn't been taught that. Um, and that was shocking to me, especially with having um, what I thought was, you know, some pretty well-rounded studies going, wait, Greensboro's home to these amazing things. I had, I had never been taught this. What, what else am I missing? And it was just that re, you know, going back to the Greensboro elders, what can, what am I missing? What have I not been taught? Um, and having those conversations and then, you know, kind of restarting the process, but in a different, different way. So tell me more about the activist groups that you've been working with. You mentioned um, church. I'm not sure if any of that is connected. You've mentioned some elders. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of those organizations and activists? Yeah, so I'm a part of a couple different ones. So Power Beyond Pride is one here in Greensboro, um, and that's 
one of our main focus is to um, get police out of pride. Pride was built on anti-police um, and pride has now become this month where all these companies come together and say, yay, we love you. And then as soon as the next month comes, you don't hear anything for 11 months. Mm -hmm. um, and it completely takes away from the history, you know, the history and the um, black elders that fought at Stonewall and these things that were done, it, it has completely kind of misshapen um, what pride was originally done. You know, the first pride was a, was a riot. Um, and in 2020, Pride Month, this was as close as we've ever gotten to the original um, pride you know, being out on the streets in community with the BLM movement. That's as close as we're, you know, we've ever gotten to, to Stonewall and Pride, and that made a huge difference for me. Um, another group is the Hayes Art Collective, uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, Virginia. It's her um, kind of art movement, and I got connected with that through the protest and have helped her um, kind of get her social media out there and community outreach and have been a part of, you know, more of these uh, conversations with elders I wouldn't have met if I hadn't met Virginia and her family. And um, I'm trying to think of a couple more. Um, Power Beyond Pride, um, Black Elm Street. We um, had a huge kind of gathering on um, when Greensboro held the Juneteenth event. And it was kind of along the lines of what the city tried to do, but it was completely separate. So it was a musician protest and I just helped do security there, kind of walked around, make sure that um, people were doing the right thing, make sure that we didn't have uh, white folks coming up to start problems um, like we had seen in the protest before and really just made sure that um, people who didn't have a platform before had that platform to speak. Um, and that was super important to me just to make sure that individuals who had not been heard were being heard and then step in where conversations were being had that got heated and there was ignorance on display and going, hey, let, you know, why are you upset that we're, we're here doing this? This isn't hurting anybody. We have permits. Um, why are you upset? Okay, well, you're upset because the color of people's skin here or you're upset because of the message we're carrying um, and just foster those, again, that, those conversations that aren't had that are being had now. Um, and there's a couple, um, other organizations I've been in and out of just helping, um, but those are the, the three main ones. Okay. So tell me about the first protest that you attended in Greensboro related to um, either the um, reaction to the murder of George Floyd or related to Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Um, man, that day changed my life. Uh, so I got a text message from a friend on campus that said, um, cause we had been in conversation, you know, are we doing anything in Greensboro? Are there protests? And she sent me a message and said, Hey, um, it's going down. Let's go. <laughs> so went downtown, had my wife drop me off. And, uh, the marches start about started about an hour later. And, um, it was, A moment that you read in history books, you know, these moments in the 60s where communities come together and you feel the energy physically shift. I knew that that was happening and just being a part of it and realizing that we were there because another black man had been murdered by the police. We weren't here to make a scene. We weren't here to get, you know, the I like to protest button. Um, we were there to make a difference and have our voices heard. And we were also there because of Marcus Smith and everything that's gone on in Greensboro that people didn't know about had been so well hidden. And when we were marching, they um, needed a pace counter. And that's something I've just learned in being in church. You can't, you can't march unless you got a pace counter because people are all gonna walk at different speeds and different ways. And uh, Virginia came up to me and said, hey, we would, can, you, can you help us lead? So um, we, I started helping lead and I connected with, you know, Virginia, um, a couple other individuals and the leaders were out in front of us and then it was us and then the protesters linked arms behind us. And there was this moment that day that um, a gentleman named Brant, he is a um, black gay man in the community and we were leading and the 
you know, we were saying our chants and the things that we were having them repeat back to. And he, he started sobbing and he started, he said, um, am I next? Mm. Am I next? And it just, it hit everyone because that was the reality. Mm -hmm. Is this black man next? Is this black woman next? Um, what are we doing in Greensboro to make a difference? Because history has been made here. And we, um, when he did that, he started, he started crying. Um, so I just kind of, you know, came up and hugged him and put my arm around him and, you know, told him I loved him and we linked arms and I have this picture and, um, we started saying, say, you know, say his name, say her name. And the reality of how many names were on this list, you, it, it doesn't hit you until you're in the middle of it, reading all these names on a list. And there's, there's more pages than you can count because there's so many names. And then you think of all the names that aren't on the list that we haven't been told. And we all got emotional and we stopped. And I realized very quickly that I could catch my breath after being emotional and yelling. And George Floyd never got that chance. Mm -hmm. He never got the chance to catch his breath. And the only difference is the color of my skin. That was the only difference. And that just did something. It just, it, I had already, you know, been working in the community, but that realization as a, a young queer individual in Greensboro and watching the murder of someone on national television and seeing this, you know, I've, I'm 27. So um, these names are not, not new. You know, this is something we've been raised in and the debate that has happened when, when these individuals are murdered was beyond my thinking because it does become this trend in the white community. This, oh, we're, we're, we're upset. Oh, we're done. Oh, another, oh, we're upset. We're done. And I was infuriated because this isn't a moment. This is a movement that has to occur. This has to result in change because if not in 60 years, we're going to be having the same fight that 60 years ago they were having in Greensboro. And I'm not having it. I just, I, you know, that torch has been passed on to our generation by different generations. And I really think that this is a time that because of the conversations, if there's one good thing that's come out of COVID 2020, it is that these conversations can be had. But after that protest, the, there was a protest on that. The original protest was on May 30th. Um, the next protest I was not at, but the protest that Monday, I think it was April 1st. Um, we, I had gotten a call that morning from my best friend, Shemaya, that um, David McGaddy in Louisville had been murdered. So David McGaddy was a black man that was from the south side of Louisville who, man, this, this man, you couldn't um, not love him. He was that success story of, I made it, I got out, and now I'm giving back to the community. And there was this argument because they weren't sure if he got shot by a national guard or if they got, he got shot by LMPD and he was outside of his restaurant. And the only reason he got shot was because he was outside of uh, his restaurant outside of a uh, curfew. Was that and, a barbecue restaurant? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And David, I mean, first off, this man had a smile that just made you want to talk, you know, made you want to ask what he had done. And he never, let a cop walk into that restaurant that didn't eat for free. Mm -hmm. Never. There wasn't a cop that could walk in. There wasn't any sort of worker for the community that could walk in and not eat for free. Cause that's what he did to give back. Mm -hmm. So we had Brianna Taylor being murdered in the South side of Louisville, right, right down the street from where I had grown up and then David. So now it wasn't just personal anymore. This was somebody I knew and went to the next protest and cried the entire time because um david was a good guy you know and all these people are good people um it's not a a right or wrong thing these these black men and women that are being killed um are being killed because they're black they're being the court is on the streets instead of 
where it should be. You know, they're, these, these officers and people are making these decisions um, for someone's life. And seeing that happen in Louisville, when I know it's happened before, but now it's on a national level, it, I was glad that it was getting the national attention, but we are 100 plus days since Breonna Taylor's been murdered and nothing's been done. But, you know, we're still fighting. We're not gonna give up on this. This is not a fad. This is not something that is gonna go away. Um, at least it's not gonna go away with me. I hope it doesn't go away with others. But um, when you realize that you grew up down the street from somebody and you worked at the same hospital that she worked at and you had friends in common and you probably went to parties together at some point and she was murdered in her home. And then David gets murdered for being outside of his restaurant after curfew. I just, I don't see how people can't be in the streets for it. So it, even though I had this personal connection to it, it just um, put more gasoline on the fire, you know? So is there anything specific that you would say that you may have learned by being a part of the protest that you had not thought about before? Uh, one, one practical thing and then one very serious thing. First one is do not wear plastic flip-flops to a protest when the heat is going to be 90 plus degrees. First of all, let me say that these pictures are now in the Greensboro history or the uh, sandals are now in the Greensboro History Museum because they actually melted on the asphalt. Wow. So these were brand new sandals that my wife had bought me maybe a month before. Adidas white sandals and melted. So, but we joke about it because I would have trusted those sandals with my life. I had been in prayer with those sandals. I, I knew I could run in those sandals if I needed to. Those sandals had my back that day. Um, on a realistic note and a very serious note, it taught me how important it is to come to a community and to have dialogue and how, how it takes protesting to make things get done. There are so many people, especially in the white community, that are okay with people going to the Capitol with guns to protest wearing a mask. But when we are out here protesting for the murder of someone just to be investigated, it's a huge, it's like, what, what are you doing? You're, how dare you do this thing to fight for justice, but it's okay for another group to do it. And again, the only difference is the color of your skin, your sexuality, and the God that you pray to. Where the BLM community and this community that has been created is open to everyone, regardless of religion, sexuality, race. It doesn't matter. If you can foster a conversation, that's all that matters. If you listen to understand and to be educated instead of listening to respond and to argue, your whole world will change and your community will change because of it. And protest taught me that. I thought that was something that I knew, but it, it wasn't ingrained until it was ingrained <laughs> on the streets. Um, with those milk flip flops. So, also don't wear all black. It's going to get very hot very quick. <laughs> so, yeah, and I think that it's important to emphasize that because we are talking about the summertime and yeah. um, so that people get a sense of how hot it really is. Yeah. Times, I mean, when there are groups of people together. And people don't understand that when you're walking in this heat, um, it's not like wall mock, wall, mall walking. You're going to get hot very quick and you're going to sweat. When you stop sweating, you're dehydrated already. Mm -hmm. So these breaks that we're taking, it's not for you to talk. It's for you to drink. Mm -hmm. um, don't come to a protest um, just to get your protest sticker. This is not the place for that. Um, I said that to the group on the day that David, um, I got the news that David died. I gave this speech in front of these group of individuals that had come to protest and said, look, if you're here to get your protest button, you need to leave now because people are dying still. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready to stand in front of officers and make sure someone doesn't get killed, this is not the time for you to get your button. You can order a shirt online and help a black business um, grow. This is not the place for you. Um, and, you know, that's another thing to, that really needs to be taught is that you don't go to a protest to make a status about it. If you're not there for the pure reasons of making change, then you're doing it for clout and that's not, that's not going to benefit anybody, including yourself. 
So how did you prepare for the sort of mental and, and physical preparation of being involved with protests during a pandemic? Um, I didn't, and I hate to say that. I don't mm -hmm. think anything could prepare you for doing protests during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but I did decide that my health um, could be put on the line to make sure that other people lived. And mentally, there wasn't anything I could I could do to to prepare for the the hate emails and the messages and things that were said or done um, to me once my picture got out that I had been helping. There wasn't anything that I could do to prepare that except love on my wife, keep working, keep keep fighting, dig into my Bible a little more, pray a little longer, and call my friends and tell them that I love them. Because what they can't take away from me is that community that I'm building. You might, you might mess with me for about 10, 15 minutes, but I got a rescue dachshund that's super excited whenever I walk out of a room uh, and a wife who loves me. And that's all I need. And add on this new community of world changers, you know, you're going to be okay. It's going to be hard some days and you're going to, you're going to ask yourself, um, is it worth it? But when you realize that kids are dying just because of the color of their skin, um, it's work. It doesn't matter. It, you, you got to do it. And if you're not doing it, you got to be doing something else. You know, you, not everyone has to be a frontline hero or worker. Not everyone can be, um, a soldier out there, you know, doing these things, but we need people with a credit card ready to bail people out. We need people, um, sharing petitions and sharing this, you know, real news, um, and not this fake dialogue that goes on. Um, and that's been something I've really been telling people is that don't feel bad if you can't be out here in the protest, do something else. We'll get you connected. We'll get you plugged in. You know, we don't want you passing out. We can't carry, we can't carry you when it's 90 something degree heat. We'll, we'll pray for you and we'll put some water by your side, but we gotta, we gotta keep going. So, so what sort of interactions did you all have with the police? You mentioned the police. Um, certainly yeah. you were present, the Greensboro police. Yeah. What was that, that first pro that first protest, the police, um, they it, it's almost as if they were trying to agitate the situation. So we had already had permits to be out here. The police chief had been on the phone with AJ on where we were marching. So this wasn't a shock. This was something that was well thought out and planned by a genius black man. But we had cops driving by on bicycles or up side streets, just looking to do something. You could tell by their face, they were agitated, they were upset. And for us, it was just ignore them. Keep yelling louder, keep walking, you know? They can't do anything, we're, we're here in this crowd, but it was when we stopped and I was walking back to my car that I noticed a cop and a, a black gentleman, this black man was just standing stone faced and just had his arms crossed, you know, standing up and this cop was just going at him. And I was like, what? You know, all these people are turned this direction and this man's turned this way and this cop's in front of him. So I walked over and I just kind of tapped the man on the shoulder and I said, I'm just gonna step in front of you. And I did, and that cop's demeanor changed. And he was like, well, I just wanna, you know, you guys can be out here and all this stuff. And I realized his car was parked behind where we had been marching and he was by himself. So this was a cop that was pissed that we were doing work, had, had no other unit with him, didn't have his body cam on and was getting in a black man's face because he felt that he had the authority to do so. And it wasn't until a white queer woman got in front of a black man that he stopped. So I waited about 10 minutes, a couple of people came and kind of stood by him just to be witnesses. And I said, hey, I'm gonna go. Walked down the street, realized the cop had turned back around and got back in this man's face and nobody had got in between the cop and the man. And I stupidly walked behind the cop instead of walking on the side. And the cop turned around real quick. And I said, sorry, I didn't mean to walk behind you. Didn't mean to walk behind you, but I'm just gonna stand here again since we still have an issue stood there for about 20 minutes until he got back into his car and turned, did a U in the middle of the street that was already blocked off and went down the other way. But this cop was just mad that he couldn't get a, or elicit a response that he, all he needed was one person to pop off to him. 
for him to feel like he could have arrested. And then one person getting arrested leads to everyone else in a whole issue. And I saw that that day and I didn't think in the moment to get his badge number or his name because I was so worried that we were going to have another situation. And then two days later, David is murdered and we see cops blocking off downtown um, during the protest and people are in front of the justice or in front of the courthouse and there's side streets downtown just blocked so people, protesters can't get in. And that, I was kind of like, why are all these streets blocked off right now? This doesn't make any sense. But the street to get to the courthouse isn't where the protesters are, but to park in a public spot is. So unless you knew Gr downtown Greensboro, you weren't going to park that day and be a part of this protest. And that was the cops doing that. But that was also the first day of a, or first or second day of the curfew. So they were waiting for, waiting to see if, you know, at five o'clock, if we were really going to wrap up a, a protest by 645. And we did. Um, because it was planned smart. Well, there was some damage that was done. You sort of alluded to this earlier, yeah. um, that first night. Um, and so you were concerned. One of the things that you were trying to do was to make sure that that didn't happen again at some point. Yeah. You talk more about that first night and some of the looting that occurred. Yeah. So I want to say and just make sure it's very clear that the individuals who looted were not a part of our protest. Those individuals that we, we as a community looked back on to see who was there had not been a part of these protests. We kept an eye on everybody that was there. But that the other protests, we made it a point that if that is your reason to be here is to go get free shirts or to mess up Greensboro, you're not welcome and you're not a part of this community and we will take care of you as a community. We're not gonna call the cops on you because we don't need cops down here to make the situation worse but we will make sure you get to your car <laughs> and that you leave. But this conversation changed from, oh, it's activism to look at these thugs out here doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Nobody in Greensboro would, would mess up the Civil Rights Museum downtown. We had um, white supremacist groups downtown with tattoos that they were putting jackets on in 90 something degree heat to blend in with the crowd. So I am not convinced that the people who did the looting um, weren't there for another message to obscure the message because the next day, what did you hear? Looting. Downtown has been destroyed. But what did our community do? We came down there and painted. We came down there and cleaned it up. We covered it in murals. We prayed over it. We, we burned sage through it. We held rallies. We, we donated our time and our money. I didn't see any white supremacist group do that except for behind a keyboard. <laughs> so, um, but for me, it was important to make sure that that message got out that we're not here to, to mess anything up. We're here to, we're here to get into good trouble and to make some change. We're not here to get into trouble or to cause damage. We're here to inflict change. And yeah, it's probably uncomfortable seeing 150 young people or 150 to 200 cross-generational people in a street all fighting for the same cause because you've never seen it before and it's not taught in history books. Why don't you join us instead of just being upset? Why don't you help us facilitate a dialogue? You know, you don't have to agree with us on everything. That's fine. But having a dialogue to educate everybody, that's the, the biggest thing you could do is if you, instead of being upset that we're here, be upset that we have to be here. You know, make, make your anger go somewhere else. Why aren't you upset that someone's murdered? Why aren't you upset that the police are still killing black men and women in other communities, you know? And it's not just the black community. I mean, we're, we're taking on ICE. We're, taught, we're facilitating conversations with the LGBTQ community. When I say everyone's welcome, everyone is welcome, unless you're a white supremacist. And then we need to have a conversation on your ideologies. But there's a conversation that can be had. You know, that's, that's the difference. We're not saying we hate you. We're saying let's, let's not be ignorant anymore. So what would you like for people to learn about the demonstrations and protests? Um, how do you see those activities as promoting change? I would say that when you learn the civil rights in school, you're taught Martin Luther King, 
Malcolm X and Rosa Parks. You're barely skimming the surface, right? So in 60 years, what are they gonna say about us? Are they going to remember the names of those who were murdered? Or are they gonna see the change that we caused? And is that change going to be such a global change that they can't help but talk about it? The joke that we have now is, since I'm a history major and my goal is to eventually become a history professor, what sort of subject are you gonna uh, specialize in for 2020? Murder hornets, protest, impeachment? Um, pro, you know, what, what are you gonna specialize in? But realizing that this change can be so connected and intertwined in everyday life and realizing that this has to happen so that in 60 years, this isn't happening still or something worse. I mean, that's, that's the biggest lesson. Get into good trouble. Get, get, get out here. Work. Find something you're passionate about and jump on. If you don't see it, create it. If you create it, connect with others. Do you have black leadership? Do you have queer leadership? Do you have and foster conversations with people that maybe aren't connected with you normally? What are you doing to build that community? Because then you have a community, not just a group. And that, that's what changes the world is when we come into community with each other, you can't hold anything back. It's gonna change. It doesn't have an a option not to. So what are one, two, maybe three things that you would like to see that is different, as you said, 60 years from now? Um, first one is the racial, profi racial profiling of black individuals. Mm -hmm. That has to change. Um, the policing system needs to change where a gun being drawn on somebody or being killed because a knee on their neck isn't something that can even fathomly happen. And third, I would say the education system and how we're teaching. Are we teaching the erasure of people or are we teaching what really happened and not making us just seem like the good guys? Okay, good. So is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you've responded to that you would like to emphasize more? I think the only thing, and I, I know I've emphasized it a lot, but coming into community across religions, races, sex, gender, that is what's going to change our community. That is what's going to build this family that fosters conversation and change. And if we don't do that, if we don't learn that now, when we've had all summer to do so, then I don't think it could ever happen. I think we've been given this opportunity with a global pandemic to really evaluate what's going on in our world. And if you don't do that now, I don't think that you can have that conversation again. If you haven't realized it now, we can talk and figure out why, but um, this is the time to do it. There, you know, Tomorrow's not promised. Get it done today, get out there, have that awkward conversation where you don't know what's going on and just say, I'm ignorant on this. Can, can I, you know, do the education yourself first? And then if you need to reach out to your elders who are better taught or educated in the matter, do so without question. They'd much rather you ask than be ignorant. So give some more specifics about um, how you connected with Black people with elders in the community because it's certainly not a process. I just want people to to sort of um, get some guidelines on that because yeah. it's certainly not stopping somebody on the sidewalk and saying no. Oh, yes, please don't. <laughs> yeah, please don't be in the hair care aisle of Target waiting yeah. for your local. You know, the one person that you see that is a minority to ask mm -hmm. a question that is not appropriate. Um, <laughs> you will be told off. And if I find out about it, I'm going to tell you off too, in a very respectful way. First thing is get connected in groups. There is a lot of Facebook groups. Um, Anti-racist white folks for people in Greenfield um, is one. Um, get connected with different communities and churches. Um, ask if there is black leadership. If there's not, ask why not. Um, but more so than anything, do the education your first, yourself first. It's not the responsibility of the black community to educate you in 2020 if you don't come with some knowledge and questions. So you can't sit down in front of 
your, you know, the, your token black friend, as you know, people will say and say, all right, tell me all about it, racial injustice and I'm ready to learn and change. Do you have the next rest of your lifetime to have a conversation? Because that's, um, you know, don't come ignorant to, to the table, come bringing something, come bringing questions. Um, but make sure that your community that you have is not, like you said, waiting in a target aisle <laughs> to ask a question. Facebook also, you know, don't message somebody you don't know on Facebook and say, hey, I have questions about this. Can you tell me, you know, because um, Facebook and any sort of social media messages can be so misconstrued and misread and misinterpreted that even if you come with the best of intention, it's not going to sound like you're coming with the best of intention. So I would say examine why you don't have elders in your community first. Ask yourself that question. Mm -hmm. Then say, okay, what about the community I'm involved in? Is there anybody in my community that is an elder? I've noticed and have had this conversation that the white community doesn't really look up to its elders the way that other minority groups do. There's not this um, respect of elders and coming to the table. And that was something I was taught by my best friend's family and being in church. Um, you're taught, you know, to respect your elders um, and to seek them for guidance because they've been through this. I don't think the white community has that. And I think it's because they don't, we don't trust each other. I can't, I can't immediately connect with somebody that I see across a Walmart and know they've gone through the same thing I have, or they know what it's like to be black, you know, black in America or white in America or queer in America. Because I don't know if that person's a white supremacist. I don't know if that person's going to follow my wife and I out to the car. And we weren't raised to have conversations between each other. Mm -hmm. So if you're not in this white community that your little white community builds, that doesn't group with this other white community or this church or whatever have you, political affiliation or school, or um, there's not a fostering of, um, you know, speaking to elders. So you really have to examine your, your inner self and your community first. And then connect with other communities, but do so in a way that's not, hi, I don't, I don't have any um, black friends. I was just wondering if you would like to, uh, to do this or, hey, I don't, I don't have any um, queer or gay or LGBTQ friends. Um, how about I ask you all these very personal questions when you haven't done the work to educate yourself yet? When you come educated and wanting to learn and wanting to listen to understand and not listen to respond, elders and communities will open the doors and their arms and their families to you. Um, when you come ignorant and with hate and just wanting answers because you feel like you're given them, which is a small token of white supremacy, you feel like somebody owes you the answer and that they have to sit down at a table and discuss these racial inequalities or these huge things that you should become educated on. That's just a small token of white privilege and white supremacy that is ingrained in, uh, in the white community. And I always say that when you're in the white community and then you start getting put in other boxes. So if you're in the white community and you're LGBTQIA, if you're in the white community and you're LGBTQIA and then maybe non-religious, all these things, the white community starts putting you in separate boxes where you start getting closer to other communities, if that makes sense. Because the white community, the white straight Christian community is always going to feel like they're here. Every other group and subsection, they feel like they're, a part, they're above and that they have authority over and when they start putting you in boxes or groups and feeling like you cannot be connected with the community as a whole, you start realizing what inequality is like. Not because you experienced it firsthand, but because the community itself puts you in a place where these inequalities could happen. And you get closer to other communities and you start seeing it more and you start hopefully becoming educated, but the flip side to that is that a lot of um, LGBTQIA youth, um, especially in the white community that are thrown out um, or abused or what have you, or even, you know, any kid that speaks out politically against their family, they're abused, they're thrown out. And um, suicide or um, self-harm is something that is so rampant among these kids. Um, because they don't have elders in a community to go to because they've never had to have a community. They always thought that they were just in this community. The moment they go step outside of it, they feel like there's nothing because they've never seen it. They just know that this is here and other groups are across 
across the way, but they're not invited to those groups either. And that's not the case. Those groups want you just as much, just make sure that you come with an open heart and not because you've been hurt. Come because you want to learn, not because one group didn't want you, if that makes sense. I know I've kind of rambled a little bit, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, there's so many important things just to, to zone in on that, that, you know, speaking to your elders and speaking to people who have been through this before and can give sound advice like don't wear plastic flip-flops on a 98 degree day just because you prayed in them and feel like God is with you in those flip-flops um, or don't wear all black and make sure there's water. Um, simple things that our generation didn't have to learn that people 60 years ago that did this, no, without a fact. And then they can laugh at us when we're sitting at the dinner table two weeks later talking about the white girl with the white flip-flops who's made <laughs> you know, pictures and how that's now the running joke between our community that everything was ready except those white flip-flops. Mm -hmm. But I had elders that called to check in to make sure I was good. And then, then they joked on me, mm -hmm. which I accepted with open arms. I loved it. <laughs> okay, great. So that ends our recording. Thank you so much.